Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at ANU, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the people of the Ngunnawal Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we are located here at ANU. And of course, we also acknowledge the traditional custodians of lands all around Australia. We'd like to pay our respects to their leaders past and present. So welcome to this seminar, which forms part of a continuing series of seminars that have been organized on behalf of the Theoretical Physics Group uh, with the Australian Institute of Physics. You are most welcome to join the group, of course. To do that, just log into your membership portal on the AIP web website, and you'll see the Theoretical Physics Group name under Topological Groups in your membership profile section, and you can click there to join up. So over the last one and a half years, I guess, or a bit longer, we have covered a range of um, diverse and interesting, I think important topics in theoretical and experimental physics with an emphasis on theory, of course, ranging fairly widely over topics such as um, dark matter, neutrino physics, uh, the metaphysics of quantum mechanics, the thermodynamics of clocks, quantum stochastic resonance, PT, symmetric, uh, quantum theory and the quantum nature of gravity, discrete time crystals, classical turbulence, amongst many other topics. And most recently, we had a talk from Osaka Oshikawa on a unified framework for conductivity in a time-dependent gauge field. If you missed any of those talks or you'd like to watch them again, uh, they're available to watch on the AIP uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this talk will also be put up there in a few days. Today's speaker is Shayan Majini from the University of Waterloo, Canada and the Institute for Quantum Computing. Shayan is, uh, has published a number of interesting papers on some relatively recent ideas in quantum mechanics that are very interesting to say the least. For example, in collaboration with Jonathan Halliwell at, the, at Imperial College London, he has published work on the relationship between quantum mechanics and macroscopic realism, the philosophical assertion that quantum systems possess definite uh, properties independently of measurement, which is not, of course, universally accepted, but exactly quite to, to, uh, to the contrary, in fact. Um, the topic that he's discussing today, however, relates to work that he has done in collaboration with Nicole Younger Halpern at the University of Maryland on some of the properties of quantum thermodynamic systems, which, of course, may have implications for both quantum mechanics and thermodynamics, and in particular, the extent to which classical thermodynamic laws may arise from quantum mechanics, which presumably they have to in some sense. Um, in particular, they have studied the construction of Hamiltonians, which conserve non-commuting charges globally, while allowing transportation among subsystems. Um, Shayan is the winner of the um, Vanier Scholarship offered by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And with Professors Raymond Flum and um, uh, Chris Wilson, he has co-authored a book on the physics of the various approaches to quantum computing that are under development of the Institute for Quantum Computing in Canada. His talk today is entitled Non-Commuting Charges, Bridging Theory to Experiments. Thanks, Shayan. Over to you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm yeah, very excited to be here and very excited to talk to you about koi fish and marine biology. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I assure you this talk is about physics. I just, I have a deep love for koi fish. And while we were doing this project, I saw an analogy between our work and koi fish. I'll explain the analogy uh, more towards the end. So that's my, my bait and hook to, to keep you here for the, for the extent of the hour. So. Set that up. Okay, great. So I want to start with the origin of the field. This, this notion of non-commuting charges, why are people interested in, what motivated it, where did the field come from? And I want to share some results that hooked me into this uh, subfield. So it originates from introducing a non-classical twist into a very commonplace problem. So across thermodynamics, one of the most fundamental interactions is that of systems exchanging quantities. This may be heat, particles, magnetization, electric charge. And we see these in interactions such as a cooling cup of coffee, uh, an electrochemical battery, spins flipping to align in a magnetic field. Really just across uh, so many different disciplines, we have this, this basic interaction. 
Well, these quantities are, we refer to them as charges if they're conserved throughout the entirety of the system. So in my very simple two subsystem picture here of system A and system B, if Q1 is conserved between system A and B in total, it's a charge. So globally conserved quantities are charges. So we study these charges in, in many different settings in the examples I gave, for instance. And one common implicit assumption is that these charges commute. I think naturally, if we're doing classical thermodynamics, it's a very fair assumption to make. The notion of non-commutation doesn't arise. But if we want to do quantum thermodynamics, if we want to understand the thermodynamic implications of different quantum phenomena, then we're really compelled to lift this assumption. You know, Non-commutation underlies uncertainty principles and relationships with measurement disturbance. So it's really a fundamental non-classical phenomenon that we need to understand if we're to do quantum thermodynamics. So we ask this very simple question of, well, what if Q1 and Q2, what if our two charges don't commute? And this seemingly innocuous question has generated this growing subfield. I have a few references here. In reference for our, the work Nicole and I do here, we have a compilation of these references. Um, but even that has already become outdated from a year ago. So we have another paper coming on the archive this month that'll have an, an updated list of these references. But I, I want to highlight a few results that caught my eye when I first came to this field. One was a generalization of the microcanonical state. So we have states that are, are subspaces of many different uh, charges and they appear in many different problems in thermodynamics. So for instance, a, a microcanonical state would arise if we're preparing a global system and we would prepare it in some state that might be an eigenstate of let's say uh, some charge like a particle number. And then we trace out part of the system as the bath and then we're left with the remaining system. And the form of that, the state for that system is the very familiar thermal state. So the microcanonical state is present in many, many body physics problems. And there's this generalization of it. So I thought, okay, why is that necessary? Why do, how would we even do that? If we have multiple non-commuting quantities, they can't share a simultaneous eigenspace. So, so what gives? So that was interesting. Another one that caught my eye was that uh, there was work done where they study theoretically, if you bring together two, into, uh, two baths and they're allowed to exchange quantities, and the quantities they exchange are non-commuting, they found a reduction in the rate of entropy production um, during that exchange. Related to this, since you know this is a reduction in entropy production, there's been some results that suggest that non-commuting charges may hinder thermalization. And there's actually a lot to be said there about hindering thermalization. So I wanted to kind of unpack that statement because it's one that I'm particularly interested in. And why do we think that? Why do we think non-commuting charges may hinder thermalization? And I'll give three of the reasons here. And the last one is actually an experimental result that I'll discuss at the end. Well, one is the primary setup that's known to promote thermalization may not be achievable. So the story I just told a moment of ago of preparing a global state in an eigenstate of some particle number, waiting for the system to evolve or um, and looking at a subspace or equivalently tracing out some part known as the bath. Well, with non-commuting charges, they don't share an eigenbasis. I can't list my non-commuting quantities and say, okay, I'll begin in an eigenstate of all of them. Generally, there isn't some simultaneous eigenbasis for it. So that's kind of out the window. It's also been shown that a, the global Hamiltonian with non-commuting charges, the spectrum contains more degeneracies. And arguments for thermalization rely heavily on non-degenerate Hamiltonians. And there's a, a reference there at the bottom, reference seven explains that in, in detail, that if you're curious about what that argument is. And then additionally, there's, there's been many derivations of the thermal states form. And going through them, many of them break when we have non-commuting quantities. So there I've listed uh, reference nine, 10, and 11 are original works that looked at different derivations that broke down. Uh, and reference eight there gives a nice uh, recap or a nice introduction to some of these. 
So, and particularly it's on page 17 for those who are interested in the arguments. So there's a lot there. It seems that non-commutation, something that usually we encounter as a very abstract notion in very early quantum mechanics can have significant impact on a very simple problem that we also learned in a very early undergraduate course. So I thought this field was interesting and immediately my eye goes to, well, let's see what happened experimentally. Um, but if you go to find those results, you're gonna notice a gap. And that gap is that most discoveries have been abstract, mathematical and information theoretic. So I work at the Institute for Quantum Computing where we're split between theorists and experimentalists. And this close collaboration there means that, you know, as soon as the, their tools are there that we can start doing things experimentally, the experiments begin to happen. And looking at the results, it, it wasn't so clear to me why the experiments hadn't happened yet in the field of non-commuting charges. And I think the answer comes from the, this well-known quantum thermodynamics review where they say an abstract view of dynamics, minimal in the details of Hamiltonians, is often employed in quantum information. And so is the case in quantum information thermodynamics. Essentially, we like maps. We like inputs and outputs when we're doing theory. And we're not always so concerned about the details of the Hamiltonian. But Hamiltonians are the language of experimentalists. So if we want to go from this abstract mathematical description of charges to experiments, we need to build Hamiltonians. So those were either necessary. Now, why do we even want to bridge the gap? You know, I think, I'm, I'm, as far as I understand, talking the group of theorists, so you're probably saying, you know, there's something wrong with theory. Why don't we just stick with our theory? But there's a few uh, compelling reasons to bridge this gap. One is that it's been proposed um, that we can see a, an emergence of a quantum equilibrium state. So this is a something like a thermal state but with non-commuting quantities. And it's curious to see, can we observe that? Can we see signatures of it? Another is, I mentioned the decrease in entropy production. And anyone who's studied uh, heat engines, it's probably very excited about the possibility there. Are there applications of this decrease in entropy production to building more efficient quantum heat engines? A similar vein, this hindrance to thermalization, if we have some kind of way of of maybe slowing or resisting or hindering the arrow of time, what are the applications of that to quantum memories? Can we store quantum information for longer periods of time? Or can we somehow protect our information and maybe there's applications there to some form of quantum error correction? So groups, people have been interested in maybe in these questions. And by moving to experiments, we can help fill in, if we fill in this gap, we can see applications that can emerge. So this gap was there, it seemed useful to fill. What did we do? Well, we had many questions. One was, do these Hamiltonians even exist? If they do, what do they look like? How would you construct them? For what charges can you construct them? And what we set out to do is have a systematic approach to the physical realization of non-commuting charges in quantum thermodynamics. And so our result was a procedure for constructing these. And our two primary aims were that the Hamiltonian would move non-commuting charges between subsystems. So just conserving them is not enough. The, the identity is no interaction at all, and it conserves anything. So we still wanted some movement. We wanted non-commuting charges to move locally between subsystems. We want to promote that movement as much as we can. But we also want to conserve the charges globally. And then some other features that would be of interest from conversations with different physicists. One is that, well, we want to be able to couple arbitrarily many subsystems together. I mean, in short, uh, many body physics is more exciting than one or two body physics. So there's interesting problems we can solve if we can couple many subsystems together. So that was a feature we liked. We want to have the potential for the Hamiltonians to be non-integrable. Uh, the extent of what I'll say about integrability is that it's shown that a Hamiltonian that's non-integrable will promote thermalization. So if we're interested at times in studying thermalization, then we'd want to promote that. And finally, we wanted it to be realizable with many different physical implementations. 
if we're at some university or online giving a seminar, someone's thinking, you know, that sounds neat. I want to do that in my lab. We want to make sure their lab could do it. So realizable with many different physical implementations. So with superconducting circuits, for example, ultra-pulled atoms and trapped ions. So all of that was hopefully uh, enough to convince you that the rest of the seminar is worth listening to. And if that did convince you, this is what you'll be in store for. So first I'm gonna present the setup that we consider, both the physical setup and the mathematical setup for our procedure. I'll then go through the procedure for constructing these Hamiltonians. And we're gonna illustrate the procedure with the simplest example I can. Then I'm gonna propose a experimental design just to show the experimental feasibility of this work. And then I'm gonna to go to my favorite part, which is the outlook. Where do we go from here? We've, we've built this Hamiltonians. We've, in the process, bridged some ideas together. What's next? And hopefully we'll, I'll, I'll save a lot of time for that. So let's dive right in. We're gonna start with the setup. So the physical setup is that we have a global system of N identical subsystems. And these subsystems can have any structure. Here I have them as a one dimensional chain, but it could be a 2D chain, whatever structure you like, but for now, let's just keep it simple. There'll be N of them. I'm gonna index them with J. If we'd like, we can divide the system into some kind of system of interest and an effective bath. And again, that would be interesting in answering some questions, but this division isn't inherent to the procedure. So I'm gonna build the Hamiltonian that's gonna cause this interaction. Um, and whether or not I wanna think of part of the system as the system of interest or not is, is really up to the question I'm trying to answer. And then between these sites, we're gonna have charges moving around. I'm going to note these charges as uh, with a subscript alpha to distinguish them. Now I'm going to call something a local charge. So this is not a quantity that's conserved globally. I'm going to call it a local charge, the observable on a single site. So for example, on site J, this would look like the identity operator acting on every other site and Q sub alpha acting on site J. The global charge then, this is the quantity I've been talking about when I speak about charges is a sum over the local charges on all the sites. So those are our local charges. We're gonna sum over them to have our global charges. And our goal is to find a Hamiltonian that transports the local charges. So here, I, what I want then is my Hamiltonian to not commute with the local charges. If it does, it conserves them as well and it doesn't move them around. So essentially there's no dynamics at play and there's nothing interesting we can study. So it is definitely not sufficient to find a Hamiltonian that conserves global charges. We needed to, to not commute with the local charges. And obviously, like I've alluded to, we wanted to conserve the global charges. Um, if there are any questions about the setup, because the setup is important, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, you can also put them in the chat if you're comfortable with that. I think I'm allowed to, to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll take silence as it being clear or completely unclear, one of the two extremes, uh, but not anything in between. But, okay, if you're, if you're in the process of unmuting or something, or you work up the nerve to ask a question later, please feel free and, and I'll answer. So that's our physical setup. Now we're gonna look at the mathematical setup of it. So here we're gonna study charges that generate a Lie algebra. So for maybe those who haven't studied them in a while, a Lie algebra is just a vector space equipped with one other uh, feature, and that's a Lie bracket. So a Lie bracket is a bilinear, so it, it takes in two vectors, spits out one vector, and the, this re the relationship uh, obeys the Jacobi identity. So if you want a simple example, just have an intuition, the commutator, for example, is a very simple Lie bracket. So why Lie algebras? Well, Lie algebras describe many uh, conserved physical quantities. So for there, I have things you know think familiar to most: particle number, angular momentum, electric charge, and you know Lie algebras have also been can be used to describe the metric of spacetime. So they've they have very wide uh, applications. But one is describing physical quantities, and our procedure works for every Lie algebra every single one that satisfies these four properties. One is that it's semi-simple. 
we're interested in working with non-commuting chargers. Semi simple, the algebras are massive family of the algebras that are non-commuting and they're very well studied. There's lots of useful lemmas and theorems for us to draw on. We want to work with finite dimensional Lie algebras. We don't want to have an infinite number of charges. It's not very realistic. We'll have a few different linearly independent charges. We're working with quantum mechanics, hence we're interested typically in Hermitian operators. So these algebras will be over the complex numbers. And finally, maybe the one most exotic is the Lie algebras will have a metric that can be induced by the killing form. So the killing form, the extent of what you need to know about it is that it's just a, a bilinear form, it takes in two vectors and it gives you a number. And so we can use it to induce a metric. And in short, we need a metric. We need some kind of way to say, are these two charges orthogonal or not? And the killing form is a metric that happens to work well. Also, like the semi-simple Lie algebras, it is very well studied and which is very convenient to use. And you know, despite these uh, seemingly multiple restrictions, many physically significant Lie algebras satisfy them. So for example, all of SUN, SON, all other simple Lie algebras, it's a very, con everything I've listed up here, um, the algebras representing those physical quantities all satisfy these properties. So that's our physical setup and our mathematical setup. And now I'm going to use that setup to illustrate the procedure. And I'm going to use the simplest example I can with non commuting charges, quantum information theorists' favorite algebra, that's SU2. It's generated by the three poly matrices, it represents spin half angular momentum. And like all other algebras, it's characterized by a dimension C. That's the number of generators in the basis and its rank, which is maybe less familiar. It's the dimension of its maximal commuting subalgebra. So how you determine the rank is you take your algebra, you pick out one element, you ask how many other elements does this element commute with? You write down that number. Do the same for the next, 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 go through all the elements of the algebra. And eventually you'll find which elements of my algebra commutes with the most other elements. Whatever number that is, that's your rank. So in SU2, you have three poly matrices and none of them commute with any others. So the rank is one. The best you can do is you can take one and it'll commute with itself, but none others. So that's the rank. And these two numbers will be valuable for us in our procedure. And the, the gist of the procedure, so what you're about to see is I'm gonna introduce a type of iteration and I'm gonna repeat the iteration C over R times. And each iteration is gonna to add terms to our Hamiltonian. Oh, I see a question came in the chat. Yeah, so I would be, um, so there's a question here in the chat. Uh, there seems like there could be a classical analog with commutators replaced by Poisson brackets. So I would uh, agree. And I think there is a, a natural route we could go with ad adopting this procedure. Um, the, the motivation would then be, uh, why would, are people interested in studying Hamiltonians that conserve uh, commuting charges? Um, and are they interested in that? Uh, if they're interested in that, uh, are those things unknown? Uh, would it be difficult to find such Hamiltonians? Uh, I think if the answer to the, both those questions is yes, then I agree uh, extending this work in that direction is a very natural and, and sensible, um, a very fruitful route. Uh, the, the part that I'm unsure of is whether there is um, a lot of interest currently in identifying Hamiltonians that move commuting charges locally, but conserve them globally. Because it, it's, in a sense, it, it can be very natural. You can just uh, use ladder operators to increase the quanta of some charge on one site and decrease it somewhere else. And you can do that on any number of sites. And because the quantities commute, you're not concerned that moving one charge around is gonna get in the way of the other charge, if you will. You can sort of just have these separate charges moving around and they will essentially be independent of one another. But with non-commuting charges, it, you add a bit of a wrinkle that, okay, if this, this charge is moving around, is it gonna get into the way of another charge moving around? And I think you'll see that with the, with the example um, as we go through the procedure. That's a very yeah, insightful question, so thank you. So then as we go through, we'll be adding terms to our Hamiltonian. 
And what we're going to end up with is a two-body interaction. And we're going to use that two-body interaction to either we can you know, connect our entire chain I, I showed earlier, and we have some long chain with ne nearest neighbor coupling, or we can use these two-body interactions to create genuine many-body interactions. Uh, when I say genuine, I mean uh, a many-body interaction that doesn't simply reduce to a product of two-body interactions. So, so that's what, how it's going to go down. So the first iteration of the algorithm will identify something known as a Cartan while basis. So all the algebras that satisfy the properties we mentioned have such a basis. What's really neat about this basis is that it comes with two types of basis elements. One of some of those, R of them, will be Hermitian operators, and the rest of them are going to be corresponding ladder operators. Cartan while bases can take very uh, interesting forms depend when you have different values of C and R. They have a nice and clean, simple form for SU2 when R is one. So, for example, one such Cartan while basis for SU2 has the Hermitian operator of this poly Z matrix. And it comes with its corresponding ladder operators, the familiar poly Z plus and minus ladder operators, which is sigma X plus or minus uh, the imaginary number times, times sigma y. And so here we have a case where we have a Hermitian operator and a ladder operator associated with it. In more complexly algebras, we may have two uh, Hermitian operators and three ladder operators that don't each just focus on one charge. They will focus on combinations of them and move quanta between them. And, and we have an example of that in the paper too, if you're interested in Whenever I speak of these more complex examples, if you're curious to see them, uh, I mean, we can chat about them more, but they also we have a very detailed in the appendix of this paper, uh, SU3 example, which shows all these other features. So we, we pick a Cartan while basis. There's infinitely many to choose, and maybe convention will dictate which one we choose. So I chose this one here to illustrate. And we add that sigma z to our, our local charges, and we'll use that to construct our global charges. So sigma z will be used to build our global charges. And we're going to use the ladder operators to build our Hamiltonian. So what we're going to do is we'll build a term, and it's going to exchange the charges between two bodies. So what I uh, have here, assuming you can see my, can you see my mouse? Probably should check that before. Maybe, I don't know, David or Murray. Okay, I'll, I'll try to avoid using the mouse until someone tells me you can't see it. Uh, what well, you have here in the bottom equation, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, oh, you can? Oh, wonderful. Okay, so here what you have is you have some coupling frequency. And what the coupling frequency is doing is it's controlling the frequency of some exchange. You have some operator here that's raising a quanta of our charge of interest right now, so sigma z. It's raising it on the J site and lowering it on the J prime site. And you have the Hermitian conjugate of that happening here. We need the Hermitian conjugate term because you know, it's a Hamiltonian, uh, so it has to be a Hermitian operator. So here we're, we're doing some exchange. And, and right now there's nothing about this that has anything to do with this being non-commuting. You could do what I've done so far with commuting charges and, and be okay. What you then do is you go through many other iterations of what I just showed you. And you'll identify many other Cartan while bases. Which bases do you choose? You choose those which are killing orthogonal. So if something is killing orthogonal if its killing form is zero. And again, I think the what's important to know um, here is just that this is a notion of orthogonality. So this is some metric we can use to say that our charges are orthogonal and that they'll eventually, if we have enough of them, we'll form a basis. We'll identify U as an element of the corresponding Lie group because we want U to be able to act on our elements of the Lie algebra. So it's, that's why it's an element of the corresponding Lie group. And the U will act on our set of all the charges we have so far, and it'll map us to a new set of uh, charges. So we have some Q alpha originally, and we go some Q alpha plus R. What we do is we constrain U so that all the new charges are killing orthogonal to all of the other ones so far. We find that U, and then we use that U to construct our new charges and our new ladder operators. Again, there will be some choice. And again, convention may dictate um, what you do with that choice. 
For SU2, we choose Q2 and Q3, just for simplicity, uh, to be sigma x and sigma y. And again, they have their corresponding ladder operators. And we just repeat steps two to four, so we have C charges. Now the procedure does terminate with C charges. It's a proposition I have in extra slides, if anyone's inclined to see that proof. And the charges will ultimately form a basis. So that's a theorem that I also have in extra slides. So moving along, we have our global charges and we have the terms in the Hamiltonian. And we now need to adjust the coupling frequencies. So we had these J sub betas and they adding up the uh, terms to our Hamiltonian from the different iterations, we get something that looks like this. We have a sum of a bunch of different terms exchanging charges between sites. So this is three terms would be for each of the, the poly matrices, each with a different frequency. Now, if they're commuting charges, this would be fine and they can each do that into, independently. But because they're non-commuting charges, that isn't always the case. So what we have to do now is we have to go and constrain the J betas such that they can serve the total charges. So for SU2, this results in the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Now, I think there's uh, either one of two ways to, to respond to this result. One is, oh, I didn't realize the Heisenberg Hamiltonian did that. Or if you did know that, you may say, you know, all that for the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Um, but really the answer is just that this is a, a, the simplest example of a much larger family of the algebras that we could run this procedure for. So it's somewhat comforting that in the simplest example, we get a, a simple looking Hamiltonian and one that's well studied. And it's nice to, uh, maybe those who have been working with Heisenberg Hamiltonians would, would know this feature, but um, it's not written somewhere in the literature that it has this, this dynamic where it moves SU2 charges locally, but conserves them globally. And I think what, what's really important, I think, to highlight here, and the point that can be missed, is that by doing this constraint, here we find the, frequent, the coupling frequencies are all equal. But for other examples, we can find interesting ratios between them, that certain charges need to move at twice the rate of other ones to be able to conserve all the charges globally. And you see that with the SU3 example. So I alluded to k-body terms. And this is an optional step. I think for a lot of instances, uh, people are content with having this two-body interaction. You couple different sites, you create a chain, maybe you create a grid, whatever you like. But if we're interested in maybe in some many-body um, interaction, we can we have a procedure to do that. And so what we do is we first multiply the two-body interactions together between some combination of sites. Here I have three sites. So site J and J prime, J prime, J double prime. Each of these three is coupled to each other. And then after I do that, I drop all second order uh, two body terms. That way I'm left with strictly a three body interaction. And then I apply the constraint again to find J. So here we find this interesting looking Hamiltonian where we have the poly matrices in a cyclic order minus the poly matrices in an acyclic order. And uh, what this Hamiltonian does is it conserves again SU2 globally, but it moves the charges locally. Uh, with purely three-body interactions. And essentially, I think the motivation to go down this path is that if you want to ensure your Hamiltonian is not integrable, you essentially just add more couplings. So the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, it's known that the Hamiltonian with nearest neighbors couplings is integrable, but with next nearest neighbors is non-integrable. So you just keep adding couplings. So we're gonna summarize the procedure here. And so what did we do? We identify a cartan weil basis. We add the humission operators to our basis of charges. And then we use the ad, uh, ladder operators to add terms to our Hamiltonian. So then we're going to repeat this many times, adding more charges and adding more terms to our Hamiltonian. Then we constrain the coupling frequencies to have the Hamiltonian we desire for two body interactions. And we'll use the two body terms to build k body terms. So that's our procedure. Uh, again, feel free to put any questions in the, the q and I'll see that or, um, yeah. So I think a natural question is great. You have this procedure, um, but the, the whole idea is to move to experiments. So great, you can come up with these Hamiltonians. You can come up with these interactions to study non-commuting charges. 
So it's actually possible to do. Now, one of the, the results from the Outlook will kind of give away that, yes, it is possible to do. But at the time of writing the paper, I want to illustrate this with a, a physical system that quantum information theorists love, and that's the transmon. Quantum computing experimentalists also love the transmon. So if you're familiar with the transmon, you're probably used to seeing it as a qubit. It's a two-level quantum system. But transmons have also been used as qtrits. So the transmon is a slightly anharmonic oscillator that's built from superconducting materials. And I emphasize slightly because the gap in energy between the ground state and the first excited state isn't too different from the first to the second excited state. And because of that, with limited modification to the microwaves used to control transmons, you can control this second coupling. So you can actually very easily take, uh, I don't know if an experimentalist has actually done this, might, might smack me for saying easy, but at least as a naive outsider looking in, uh, those who have done it, it seemed like with minimal modification, they could, they could do that. So they, and they have been used as Q-trits in, in academic labs. And they've been done with about up to eight Q-trips now. And then that number may be growing. Uh, Irfan Sidiri's group, for those familiar with him, has done transmon Q-trit experiments that are very impressive. Now there's uh, decoherence times. That's what these T2 star times are. It's just how much time do you have before you've lost your quantum information? At what point are you toast? What's the upper limit to your experimental time? And so for uh, the first transition, it's about 40 microseconds, well, 39 microseconds and about 14 for the next transition. Those have been achieved. You can do two future gates on the order of 10 to 100 nanoseconds. If we want to be very pessimistic and say it'll take an order 10 of them to do a three future gate, it's likely less, but let's err on the side of caution. Then we can still have information transverse in a future system uh, 10 times which you know, should be a, enough movement of information to see signatures of thermalization. So here's one uh, setup that would be interesting, I think, to explore non-commuting charges on, superconducting transmon systems. So a summary of, of everything here, and that's what we did is we presented a procedure for constructing Hamiltonians that transport non-commuting charges locally while moving the charges globally. So we can now bridge abstract mathematical description of charges to experiments. Now, the, the astute amongst you are probably sitting there with the burning question, and it's not the outlook. So what about the fish? You promised me fish. So we'll now get to the fish. Well, really, the fish have an interesting analogy, I think. One is that we're dealing with this closed system. I think the closed system is like the koi pond itself. The, the charges uh, correspond to the different species of fish. So the charges are allowed to move locally, but they're confined globally. They can't get out of the koi pond. That's like the koi fish can move, swim around locally, but they can't escape. They're stuck within the confines of the koi pond. And we saw that these fish aren't moving independently of one another. You know, if they were maybe commuting fish, uh, a, all the red fish wouldn't care that the white fish were there in the lake with them, they would, or the pond with them. They would just swim right through them as if they were immaterial. But the presence of one charge alters the path of others because they're non-commuting. And so the, the path of the one fish here, you can see, maybe interferes with the path of the other fish. So as a, as a big fan of koi ponds and a big fan of theoretical physics, I was compelled to draw this analogy. And uh, I think Nicole and I was asking me to write a blog post about it. So if you look up koi fish in the algebras, you'll probably see the blog post. So here's my favorite part. It's the outlook. Um, so you have these things, what's next? Uh, mainly because, you know, when I, whenever I get to the outlook of a talk, it's when I open up opportunities for collaboration from other physicists in the audience. So one is that I, I claimed earlier that there's this other thermal state, this non-abelian thermal state. And is there any way we can see signatures of it? Can we set up an experiment with non-commuting charges, watch them evolve, and measure what state it approaches? So if you're really excited to do that, and I, and I got your hopes up, I'm sorry, that has already been done. There's a recent work that was on the archive. And there they saw, um, they were able to see some potential signatures of this non-abelian thermal state and non-commutation um, in a way hindering thermalization in, in that setup. Others that people haven't done yet, one is the decrease in entropy production I mentioned. 
the application of daily quantum heat engines, the hindrance of thermalization, and its application to quantum memories. So I already spoke about them, but I think those are things that are very interesting to study and definitely merit testing. Another question is bridging these uh, results to other fields. So one uh, structure that you may be familiar with are page curves. So page curves uh, characterize the entanglement within a system. So one can then ask, well, you know, entanglement is very fundamental to understanding many body dynamics. There's a lot we can learn from how entangled the system is. And we can ask, well, what are the effects of non-abelian symmetries or what are the effects of non-commuting charges being constrained on page curves? Does the presence of non-commutation increase the entanglement or does it decrease the entanglement? So that is the work that'll be coming on the archive this month. And uh, I guess a spoiler for it is that what we find is that non-commutation tends to raise the page curve compared to commuting constraints and thus increase entanglement entropy, um, which has interesting app uh, applications then to understanding the effect of non-commutation on different many-body dynamics, but also seeing the relationship between two sort of pillars of quantum theory, non-commutation and entanglement, and understanding how they're related. Others we haven't worked on yet, one is looking in high energy and nuclear physics. So with non-abelian gauge theories, it's, it's not clear how to define or how to measure thermalization. So for example, in quantum chromodynamics. Well, these notions are well-defined. It can be measured clearly in uh, thermodynamics. We have this bridge here to, to high energy nuclear physics because the symmetry of non-abelian gauge theories so with QCD, for example, described the SU3 symmetry. So can we use these Hamiltonians to kind of translate results between these fields? So that's a question I'm interested in. Others generalizing many body thermalization tools. So one way to understand thermalization, how thermalization comes from uh, you know, well-defined quantum states and their evolution is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So that is one that Nicole and Mark Straninsky's group recently did a paper on that, generalizing the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis to accommodate non-commuting charges. But I mean, Nicole has more to be done there and is, is eager to continue working on that. There's also some tools such as out of time order correlator, order correlators, um, some refer to them as maybe OTOX, if you're more familiar with that term, and random unitary circuits. And these, both of these tools have been used to quantify how chaotic a system is. It's, you know, people have studied quantum chaos with these tools. And in the same vein that we asked the question, well, do, do non-commuting charges increase entanglement? It'd be also interesting to ask that they make systems more or less chaotic. Because between how chaotic the system is and how entangled the system is, you really gain a lot about a system. And again, it's interesting to study these on a range of implementations. So the experiment at the top, uh, reference 13, that was done with a trapped ion uh, system. I mentioned how it can be done with superconducting circuits. But it's also possible to do these with ultra cooled atom setups. So that is the end of the planned content. I'm now happy to take questions. To thank you all for listening. Uh, thank my supervisors, uh, Ramon Laflamme and Nicole Younger Halpern, for their support in all this work. Thanks, Sean. That was a really interesting talk. Just while people are formulating their questions, if they have them, I might kick things off. Um, sure. You you preempted a question I was going to ask when I was listening to the talk. I thought, now what's the relationship going to be between um, commutation of, of um, exchange of non-commutating charges and entanglement of those two systems. You, you mentioned that in your um, outlook. Um, pardon my, my naivety, but what's a page curve? <laughs> sure, yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, yeah. so, so they first uh, arose in trying to answer questions around the black hole information paradox. And so essentially what it is, oh. is I think they're simple to introduce in the context of uh, and a, a lattice. So you imagine you have n sites <clears throat> and you want to know the entanglement within the system. So what you can do is you can take a single site and measure its entanglement with the rest of the system. Then you can take two sites and measure their entanglement with the rest of the system. Then three sites, four sites, et cetera. And what you get is this curve of the entanglement between a subsystem and the remaining system as a function of the subsystem size. So you can see in any possible cut of my system, how entangled is it with the rest of the system? And so uh, 
you may ask, well, what state do you choose? And the answer is you sample over, how randomly you sample over different states and you'll take the average value. So what the page curve tells you is the average entanglement as a function of the uh, subsystem size. How entangled is the subsystem with the remaining system? And they've been, recently they were studied with a commuting symmetries and there's been interesting results there connecting ergodicity and quantum chaos. But motivated by these developments with non-commuting charges kind of compels us to ask, well, what happens when you constrict page curves with non-abelian symmetries? And I'll just sort of continue on this thread a little bit because I think I, I've been working on it the last like nine months. So it's a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, what, what you essentially we did is we built models that we argued were analogous, where one conserved commuting charges and one conserved analogous non-commuting charges. And then we both numerically and analytically found that for any model, uh, any subspaces that were comparable, uh, the non-commuting page curve was always higher. So the entanglement entropy was always raised. I actually had a chance to speak with uh, Bill Phillips, who he's a Nobel Prize winner here in um, University of Maryland. And I was asking him, you know, what do you think about these results? Do these make sense? Like, how do you interpret them? And I loved his answer. He said, well, you know, non-commutation, that's something quantum mechanical. Entanglement is something quantum mechanical. So it's kind of nice that more of one gives you more of the other. <laughs> and I love that. I said, thank you, Bill. That's uh, yeah, yeah, that, uh, that, that, yeah. That, that narrows it down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question from Vladimir Bazanov who wants to know, in a system of mechanical particles, the angular momenta of individual particles change, but the total momentum is conserved. Is that what you're talking about? Is that a more familiar example of the system sure. that you're talking about? So here's, it's a little bit uh, more specific. It's not just the total angular, uh, total momentum that's being conserved. I'm oh, sorry, it's the... I'm so the, the angular point. momentum of individual particles and the total momentum. I think it means the total angular okay. momentum. Is so it's a bit more than that. Here we're interested in the total angular momentum, uh, the component of that along each axis being conserved. So if it was only the total angular momentum, that would be one global charge. So that would, but oh. we want three. So we want the total angular momentum in the x component, the y component, and the z component, each of those to be conserved. But we also want the charges to be moving around still locally. So there's these exchanges happening, but the total angular momentum along any, uh, the component along any axis is still conserved globally. So yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so then, so then what's the relationship then? I'm just trying to think, then what would be the relationship then between the, uh, the exchange of non-commuting non variables and say Noether's theorem? Um, right, right. So with, with another theorem, we're told, you know, with, um, I guess like that maybe it was how we pick our charges. So we're saying, you know, we have some quantity we want to conserve, so there's some symmetry. So it gives us a way to go between a, a symmetry and some uh, conserved uh, quantities. Um, so it might play a role in kind of like our setup. Right, I see. Uh, it interesting to see from a theoretical point of view how one actually constructs that. That's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting um, issue. Yeah. Um, Vladimir Bazanov made a follow-up comment in the solar system, all three are conserved. Yeah, I guess the global system, the, well, as far as I know, if we think of our solar system as a, as a closed system, uh, yeah. which is very likely you can model it as, then yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> then yeah, I think it's a good point. Yeah, these. To, to a good approximation anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, so I think any uh, quantity would then globally be conserved. But yes, I think that's right. that, it's very satisfying to be able to scale up and try to make do things make sense and scale down to make sense. And Indeed. Kind of, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, what else is I thinking? Oh yeah, in the in the transmon qubit example that you gave, I was just quickly trying to think. Now, what exactly would you measure, which would in that system, which would be right. Which would have different physical results for your, if the physics is correctly described by uh, exchange of non-commuting variables, as opposed to yeah. making the assumption that um, the Hamiltonians commute. All right. Let me come back to this here. So I think the ones that I would be very interested in studying right right now. So I think fresh on my mind is this entanglement result. Um, if this theory holds, the if we measure um, the entanglement within the qubits, we should find that if we couple these qubits to conserve non-commuting quantities, they should become more entangled. 
uh, versus if we can serve them to couple analogous commuting quantities. So that I'm eager to see in a lab, because I think that would, the, the differences we see are, act, are measurable. So there are differences on the order of tenths of nats and experiments currently can do or distinguish differences of orders of hundredths of nats. So it's within the range of things that are experimentally feasible to test. So we can see if entanglement will increase. Another one uh, I'll be curious to see, which is related to that, because you know the um, typically entanglements are quantified with en entropies, is seeing the um, if we can prepare both systems. So say instead of doing a system in bath, we prepare two systems in, in whatever initial state, and we couple them to exchange non-commuting quantities, non um, yeah, non-commuting quantities. What is the rate of entropy production there? And then we can ask a similar question with with commuting quantities. One experiment that was done that didn't require analogous commuting, non-commuting models was the one I mentioned with a trapped ion system. And what they did there is they said, okay, we there's this form that thermal states uh, take. And you know, we're used to them as an exponential of some um, you know, chemical coefficients and charge, and they sum together. And when we construct a non-abelian thermal state, we need a different derivation but it still ends up looking the same. There's the same form. We have to derive it differently, but it looks the same. So here's what we expect the thermal state to be. We've studied thermal states for many, many years. We know that if we let, leave a system, it'll eventually get to this state. What it seems to be is that when the non-commuting quantities are present, and again, this is just the first experiment, so just, I would say it's a signature of this, uh, maybe not like definitive proof, and it's a signature that calls for further investigation. We find the system starts to thermalize, but there's this distance between the state it reaches and what we'd expect, uh, the, the usual form of the thermal state. So it doesn't quite reach the thermal state that we would expect. And that was an experiment that has been done. So that's, you know, if you had asked me four months ago, what am I most excited about? I would have said that. But now that it's been done, it's, you know, poking and prodding this further. Can we make sense of this? What What is that gap? Where does it come from? Uh, my uh, the, the supervisor I haven't worked on, Raymond Laflamme, he has this intuition that maybe it's related to something to do with the um, uncertainty in the observables, that maybe there's some kind of uncertainty principle there that's creating that gap, and that's why we can't get fully to the thermal state. And I really don't know yet. Um, there's one of the things I find exciting about this subfield is just how many questions there are right now of results that have come in and that we're trying to like make sense of them, puzzle pieces we're finding that we're putting together. Oh, it's fascinating. Um, I guess my Final question would be, can you show up your list of in your uh, prescription for how you find these simultaneans? Okay. You had a nice list of steps that you went through. <clears throat> uh, well, he's over. There we go. Okay. So now there's an assumption here that we're dealing with simple Lie groups, right? Simple Lie algebras, I should say. So simple Lie algebras are one class of Lie algebra that satisfy all our criteria, but yeah. our criteria are, are slightly, um, in, in, I mean, in theory, they're more broad than that. Um, yes, yeah. But yes, at least all simple Lie algebras will satisfy this. So that's a necessary condition, but not necessarily a sufficient condition. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, there could be others. So the the four properties we mentioned are definitely satisfied by all simple Lie algebras. Yeah, but we um, we didn't you know rigorously investigate whether there exists algebras outside the simple Lie algebras that also satisfy our properties. So I'll say at least the simple Lie algebras, but the, maybe more. At least in, in abstract theory, there can exist other algebras that um, have these properties outside the simple Lie algebras. So I guess that leads on to the question. You've got a set of requirements here for your uh, procedure. Now, to what extent would this, would the set of Hamiltonians produced by this procedure be, be uh, complete? In other words, are there Hamiltonians which um, uh, are correct representations of exchanges of non-commuting charges, but which you couldn't arrive at via your, your procedure? Yes. So. There definitely could be, and um, I think how, actually, yeah. so yes, and one way to see that is if you're dealing with very simple cases with very small dimensions, what you can just do is you can take your Hamiltonian and you 
have it and you start with a completely general Hamiltonian as, as arbitrary as you can be hmm. and you force it to commute with each of your charges and you calculate the commutator there and so then you have some matrix algebra you, you need to do and then you find what's the most general Hamiltonian I can find that commutes with all these charges and I just choose those coefficients such that they're not the identity and for very small systems this isn't hard to do but once you start scaling up like for example you want to conserve you know a global charge on 50 lattice sites, it's just not feasible. And you need a more systematic approach to get there. So that's why the, the ladder operator construction we use is useful. No, oh, I see. Right, fascinating. Well, that I think that's all the questions I had for now. I'm bound to think of more as soon as we end. <laughs> sure. No, thank you. Um, that, that's really uh, fascinating. So thank you very much. Um, that was a great talk. I hope everyone enjoyed it.